Okay, this morning's reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 29 to 39. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseen this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God had raised up of which we are all written witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he pointed out this which he now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, See that my right hand, till I make your enemy to your school. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus in the crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and that every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God. We all have a good story about somebody who wins a battle. Uh, I hadn't really had a plan in my mind that Sherry would read that, but it fits in so well with what we're going to be looking at today. And then Craig talking about it as well. Salvation. What does it actually mean? How, how does it happen? And um, we want to explore a bit about um, salvation and, and, and thinking about where does it come from and, and, and how, how does it impact our lives? As Sharon was reading about David, I just had this picture in my mind of this, of this young man who, was, who had this, this wonderful complexion and, 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 and it's just a guy that was out um, in the open all the time, a young man who would defend the sheep against anything that would come and attack the sheep. God was busy training David, not just for looking after sheep, but for looking after a nation. A nation who was called by God to follow him, to obey his commands, to understand the complexities of who can be saved and who can't be saved, but then also to show them the great mercy of God and that there is a time of salvation. If you go back in, in Scripture, all the way through Scripture, we see men who rise to the top to save Israel. If we go right, right back and we think of Noah, we think of, of how he was uh, amongst the people, pagan people, and, and when he started building a boat, a boat, nobody knew what a boat was. Um, there had never been any rain, there would never been uh, showers or anything like this. And, and he said, look, there's a coming judgment that is going to be pronounced on the world. Because the world is so wicked. And if you don't get into this boat and be saved, you're going to drown. You're going to be done away with. And obviously they laughed at him. They said, what are you talking about? And people were eating and drinking, being married, given in marriage, having children, and then the flood came. And once those doors were closed, salvation was over. It was as if God was saying, okay, I've had enough, now we're going to wipe the slate clean. Obviously, the, the wickedness within the heart is, is there. And even though those eight people were 
were saved and, and they started to multiply and, 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 and move across the earth, wickedness was still there and salvation still need to be had. We think of just so many people in the Bible that have got to that place where they take the nation of Israel and they say, this is God, this is what He wants. You need to obey Him, and if you don't, there's going to be consequences. And all the way through Scripture, right up until when Jesus comes, we see this theme of people wanting to be saved, of people knowing that salvation is available, but there's a choice, as Craig was saying earlier, will you be saved or won't you? So there's a number of, of questions we need to ask. We, we need to ask, how are we saved? If you think of salvation, what, what, what happens so that we are saved? We also need to look at from what and to what are we saved? Very important. There's, there's, there's a place that we are now and then there's a place that we are when we're saved and we move from the one to the other. Um, what are we saved from and what are we saved to? Then what is the responsibility that we have once we are saved? As people who are called according to God's word, what is the responsibility? And then the next one is, how do I know that I am saved? Really, really important. Uh, John MacArthur has done a number of studies on, and, and, and the, 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 the title of these studies is, Saved or self-deceived. There are many people who are in churches today who will say, yes, I am saved. But as soon as they walk out the door, they live life exactly the, one, the, the way they want that. But then they come to church on a Sunday and they are the most holy people you can see. And we all know people like that. And sometimes maybe we were like that. Sometimes we were people who, who did whatever we wanted until a Sunday came and we, and we came and we sat here and we read God's word and we, we took communion and, and, and it seemed great until we walked out that door and we lived the way that we want to. So this is a bit of a plan of attack. I want to have a look at these um, four questions in different ways. Then I want to go to the passage that Donna read. Thanks, Donna, for, for reading that. And I want us to really dissect that to see just an example of these things that I'm going to be talking about. So let's ask the question, what is salvation? To be saved from something, you must be in trouble or at risk of being in trouble. If you need saving, there's a danger there somewhere. Being saved is to be rescued from a situation that is harmful to you or potentially destructive to people. I remember watching the movie uh, Raid on Entebbe. That's really dates me. It's uh, in the 70s, but it's a really good movie. And Charles Bronson is there and he's this supposed to be Israeli, but he's got this American accent. And they go now to save these people who have been captured by the Palestinians. And you, hear, you see them in the aeroplane going towards, and everything had to be really, really hush hush. And all of a sudden, this one Jewish guy starts singing one of the songs that they would have sang in ancient days. And it starts off with one voice. Then a second voice, then a third. And eventually the whole plane is buzzing with this, this, this Hebrew song of salvation. And it's, it sticks in my mind and, and it's, 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 it's a wonderful image. There's a movie that has been released called The Sound of Freedom. And I'm sure most of you have heard about it. It's hopefully going to be coming to one of our theatres nearby. It's all about trafficking of children throughout the world. And... Um, one man's fight to save as many children as he possibly can. You see, a great risk to this man and the many dangers involved, he sets out to liberate the children being trafficked. And I'm sure you sitting right there now, you think of children, you think of them, them, them being trafficked, you would do whatever it took to go and to help people to help these kids come 
come out of being trafficked around the world. If we use this example of being saved from a harmful or destructive situation as a starting point, salvation, as per Christianity, involves people at risk of eternal damnation. God is, has, has made it very clear in Scripture that there are two ways. There's the way of the world. There's the way of, of, of people, natural carnal, who wants to get as much for themselves and, and, and do whatever they can so that they can just gather stuff together, step on as many people as possible. Or there's the other way. There's the other way of, of, of really regarding people in their hearts. You see, there's a person that can save us from this reality. And that person is Jesus. This notion of salvation is displayed in many Bible verses. You can go to so many Bible verses. But one of the most important ones that we all know by heart is John 3.16. The, 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 the very gospel, the, the salvation of God is, is captivated in this, in this verse. For God loved the world this way. And he gave, he gave his only son, his only son, his only essence into the world. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Do you see that there's a, there's, there's, there's a, a, a giving of something and there's a receiving of something? Do you see that God, God wants to save as many people as possible by sending Jesus to the earth in the form of a man to stand in the place to be the sin offering for the sins of the world. For humanity, for humankind. To save them from a fate that is worse than death. Physical death. Can you think of anything that's worse than physical death? Spiritual death. Spiritual death. To die spiritually is the worst death that you can encounter. Because that's going to be an exclusion from God for the rest of eternity. You see, that's the gospel, that's the good news. Jesus sent to save us from ourselves, more especially from our sin. So then the next question then is, salvation is to be saved, obviously. From what and to what are we saved? You see, we are saved from sin's curse. The curse of sin has been there since Adam and Eve. Our forebearers, our, 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 our figureheads in, 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 in humanity is Adam and Eve. The first man, the first woman. And when they messed it, all, uh, messed it up, it messed it up for all of us. We all bear the mark of Adam and Eve in that garden. That sin is the legacy we bear as members of the human race. There is no way of paying for our own sin. We can try. We can do all we can. But we cannot pay for our own sin. We need salvation. We need to be saved from our sin. What constitutes sin? Well, the Bible is plain when it points to the picture of our sin. Sin is an immoral act. Considered to be a transgression of the divine law. It's an immoral act. It's an act that goes against God Himself. And it transgresses. It goes against the divine law that God has placed. Not only in a book, but on our hearts. Each one of us knows the difference between right and wrong. And God knows that we know it. But He goes to great lengths in Scripture. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. He says, Now the works of the flesh is evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. There's a list there that is so detestable and people revel in it. And it shows the sinful nature of each one of us that's inside of us that just wells up when we want our own way. 
Colossians 3 verse 5 and 6 says, put to death therefore what's earthly in you, what's earthly, what's carnal, what's normal, what's natural. Our natural uh, um, thing inside of us is, is to do stuff that transgresses God's law. And he goes on to list, he says, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire. And covetousness, which is, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God is coming to all those who would participate in these things. God wants us to realize, yes, there's a path to enjoyment. But there's a path also to death. When we partake in these things, it leads to death. So what are we saved to? If we're going to be saved from these things, what are we saved to? Well, we are saved to be like Christ. We are saved to be obedient to God's commands. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. These things that I've written down, these things that, that the Holy Spirit has given to men to write down, that we've got a record of in, in, in Scripture, obey them. Look at them. Be accountable to them. See, we are saved to a life of purity, a life of wholeness, of morality, a life that is marked by the fruit of the Spirit. You are saved to love one another, not for this, this frivolous love that the world gives, not for the, a, a lustful love, but for the love that regards everybody else is better in, than, than yourself. We are saved to, 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 to have joy in our lives, not happiness. Happiness is circumstantial. If I've got a car, I'm happy. If I've got a house, I'm happy. No, it's not that. It's a joy that is inexpressible, that, that this world does not know. We are saved to peace. You see, when we've got peace with God, we've got peace with one another. Because God's peace translates into our lives that we want to make peace with people. We are not peacekeepers, we are peacemakers. Peacekeepers will, will sweep stuff under the rug. Will, 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 will have mountains of right and, and, and just ignore it, it doesn't matter. But you see, a peacemaker will make peace. Will come to you and say, look, I am so sorry I messed up. Is there some way that we can work this out? Can, can there be peace between us? A life marked by patience. Patience. Kindness. Sometimes the world shows kindness, but, but it's always something behind that kindness. Whereas, as a Christian, we want to show kindness because that's what Christ showed us in, in, in His mercy and His kindness towards us. He laid down His life so that we could have life eternal. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, something the world knows nothing about. Self-control. That is so different to the list we read earlier. The letter to the Galatians details what a life given to Christ looks like. In the beginning he says to the Galatians, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You want to, you, you, you're done with Judaism, but now you want to go back to a sacrificial system when Christ has given everything to you? Don't go back to that. And then he goes on to tell them about the fruit of the Spirit. So then what is our responsibility? What is your responsibility as believers in Jesus in being saved? First and foremost, obedience to God's commands. As we read God's commands, as we see it right before us, we, we see it, we read it, we obey it. What's so difficult about that? We make it so difficult, don't we? Did God really say we can justify our actions, we can justify our thoughts, we can justify whatever we want? I 
Our responsibility is to cultivate the right relationship, not only with God, but with mankind. And how do we do that? Well, well, we do that by reading Scripture. To understand what God desires from me. God hasn't given us a whole lot of laws and then said, okay, work it out yourself. No, He's given us a manual to work through, to understand, to read. That's why we have Bible studies, to be able to study God's Word, to understand what it says, so that we can apply it to our lives. Application is so important. If we're just having a theological um, debate, it's going to always just be in our heads. It's never going to be in our hearts. We all know that the, 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 the furthest journey that anybody could ever uh, uh, partake in is from the head to the heart. We all know about salvation and we all know it up here. But it takes forever to get down here. And when the Spirit of God imp impacts your heart and you're able to see that He sent Jesus for your salvation, all of a sudden it goes from here to here and salvation happens. You see, we need to know God better. We need to constantly talk to Him. I want to just do an exercise quickly. Um, uh, who's been married for over 30 years? Can you just put your hands up? Okay, over 40 years? Over 50 years? Okay, there we go. Wonderful. Now, if you didn't talk to your spouse for that period of time, how long would it have lasted? Wouldn't have lasted long, would it? If you sent them an email every now and again, like, how are you doing? How's it going? Not going to work. How does it work when we speak about God but don't speak to Him? And that speaking to Him is prayer. That's all it is. It's a simple thing of, of, of just saying, Lord, do you know what? Thank you for this wonderful day. Speaking to Him. God has called us in His Word to be His ambassador. What does an ambassador do? Talks to other people on His behalf. We all know the Great Commission. Go, make disciples, baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And there's a massive promise that's there. I will be with you to the end of the age. You see, the responsibility, as we read, is to obey. And so as we obey, we go out and we speak to people about what Christ has done in my life. I used to be like this, but now I'm like this. No, it's not me. It's God's Spirit that's working in me so that I can be more like Him. We are His image bearers. As believers and followers of Christ, Paul says in Ephesians 5.1, Be imitators of God as beloved children. What does a child do? You've all seen these, these, these uh, YouTube clips of, of, of a little girl sees her mum um, putting on makeup and putting on the, 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 the um, what you call it, uh, pearls and, 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 and uh, the shoes. And, and then as mum goes out, yeah, this little girl has got the, the makeup and she's putting it on and, and, and puts the shoes in the other's clump, clump, clump. She's imitating her mother. And we should imitate our father, our brother Christ. Be imitators. So here's the big one. How do you know you're saved? How do you know you're saved? Number one, obedience. Obedience in your life to Christ. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus will say to these people who are self-deceived, Go away from me, for I did not know you. Not you didn't know me, I didn't know you. There's no relationship. You know that you're saved if there's con conviction, confession, and repentance. 
three things really, really important. Number one, conviction. The Holy Spirit convinces you that you're a sinner. You're not going to find that out on your own. There's no way. You can go through 15 lifetimes and you're not going to see that you're a sinner until the Holy Spirit convicts you. Something's got to happen on the inside. This has nothing to do with the outside. It's everything that's on the inside. It's my heart. I've got to know that, that there's something really wicked inside of me. If I, if I think I'm just the greatest, I've got a problem. The Holy Spirit convicts us. We can only be drawn to Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Confession. We love watching, um, it sounds a bit morbid, murder mysteries. It's terrible. And it seems like these, what, these towns, like so many murders happen in one town. Like, there shouldn't be anybody left in this town, but it happens. And you see them catch these people, and they sit there, and they confess. All the evidence is there of what they've done, and they confess. You see the evidence is there for your life. Confess. Not to me, not to anybody else, but to your Father who knows you, who loves you, who sent Jesus to die in your place. Confess. Just like a confession in court. And then repentance. There's got to be a turning away from where you're going to where you should be going. If you're truly remorseful about what you have done, turn away from where you're going and turn to Christ. The third way of knowing that you are saved is if there's progression towards Christ and not away from Him. You'll see some people are the same. They've been the same for 40, 50 years and nothing has changed in their lives. There's a problem there. You see, there's a thing called sanctification that's growing in holiness. As God convicts you of your sin, you grow. I'm different today than I was last year the same day. Not because of who I am. There's nothing good inside of me except Christ Jesus. God's Spirit becomes your guide, your conscience. Tells you about yourself. And we need to be told about ourselves. Sometimes we've got a blind spot. And we don't know what we are until God reveals it to us. So I've taken a long way around to get to where I want to get. Please open your Bibles. In that wonderful book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. I just want to briefly go through this and, and, and just pull out a few things and, and just see if, if it all rings true from where we've just come from looking at these four questions. You see, there's a history here where, where um, uh, Peter is, is, is standing up. You see, Peter is the same person who denied Christ. Same person who, who denied Christ three times. And then he heard the rooster and he knew exactly what he had done. And he, he was so remorseful in his own heart. He was timid. He ran away from him. A little Jewish girl went to him and said, you were with Jesus, weren't you? And he swore on heaven and earth that he wasn't and he ran away because he knew that he had denied his Lord. Now the same Peter stands before so many different people, bold, emboldened by the Holy Spirit. He says, brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, King David, he was sinful human, but he died and was buried, and his tomb is here today. They knew exactly where, where, where King David was buried. His bones lay there. Being there for a prophet, that's David. And knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would sit on his 
throne and de a, a, a descended. There was a promise of a lineage. He foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. You see, Psalm 16, verses 8 to 10, talks about the resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus would, would not only die, but he would be raised back to life. His life would not be abandoned to Hades, nor his flesh see corruption. Jesus would not be corrupted by this world. This Jesus, God raised up. And of that, we were all witnesses. These people were, were around when they saw Jesus. He said, look, look at my hands, look at my feet, look at my, my, my head, look at the, 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 the spear marking the side. I am not dead, I'm alive. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Remember Pentecost? The Spirit came down as tongues of fire and landed on people and people started to speak in different languages. There were Elamites, there were, there were all kinds of languages and people heard the good news of Jesus in their own language. Then their hearts were changed. Something happened that day which was dramatic. In the Old Testament you'd have the Holy Spirit come on one person at a time. You saw in, in, in when, when Sherry was reading about Saul and he transgressed and God took his spirit away from Saul. And we hear about the Spirit entering into David. But today we have the great privilege of each one of us having the Holy Spirit live within us. And on Pentecost that became so evident. Being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself said it. The Lord said to my Lord, sit my right hand until uh, I make your enemies your, uh, uh, your enemies your footstool. And then verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God, Elohim, has made him both Lord and Christ. Lord is a person who has authority over, over everybody. We think of lords in the old times and, and they would have a shire that they'd be over. But this is, this is so different. This is Yahweh, Kurios. This is who the Lord is. And then not only Lord, but Christ as well. Christos, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one that would stand in place of others. Now, having heard all of this, what is the response of the people? Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. What does it mean to be cut to the heart? Well, let me tell you. It's to be overcome with emotional anguish, grief and suffering at the, at the emptiness of the heart. The realization of, of the position of emptiness regarding spiritual matters. There's a big question there. Brothers, what shall we do? We understand that we are sinners. We understand that we need salvation. What do we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, the repentance before, especially in John's day, was a, was, was a coming into the family of God. But you see, this is for the forgiveness of sins. And he says, once this happens, you will receive the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. Understand that salvation is God calling you to repentance through the Holy Spirit. Nobody wakes up one day and says, you know what, I think I need to be saved. All on their own. No, there's a calling, there's a drawing by the Holy Spirit that leads us to repentance. So where does this leave us? Where does it leave us today? Are you cut to the heart for sin? Does your sin distress you? Why have you become so numb to sin that it doesn't count anymore? 
I hope that it cuts you to the heart. I hope you feel that you're alienated from God. I hope that every time we come and take communion, you, you, you see the incredible importance of forgiveness that Christ offers. I want you also to realize the role of the Holy Spirit in being saved. The Holy Spirit does something inside of us that we can't do. God longs for us to be holy as He is holy. And it doesn't happen all at once. We don't get a flood of holiness and it just it's just going to be there. No. It's something we work at every day. We say, Lord, show us your word. Show us what's in your word. How can I be obedient to this word? How can I obey you the best I possibly can? Know this, that if you're not saved today, salvation is for you. You were saved. You are being saved. And you will one day be totally saved. When we are face to face with Jesus and we've got our new bodies, can you imagine that? It's going to be wonderful. Because then that's total salvation. Praise God for salvation. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your saving work in our lives. We ask, Lord, that you would drive us on through your Holy Spirit, that we would be uh, seeking uh, holiness every single day, that we would be moving towards uh, being more holy, being more like you. I know we fray. I know we forget so easily, but please help us. For Jesus' sake, we pray.